By 2050, the human population of this planet is expected to reach 9.7 billion. With limited resources and potentially limitless demand, the future will be marked by intense competition in all aspects of life. In this struggle, many people will be left behind, unable to access healthcare, education, employment, or even the most basic necessity of life, food. Wooden crates are carefully stacked, and as they're moved, Li Bin Kai shakes the contents into a basin. Countless cockroaches pour out, some trying to escape but to no avail. Li scoops a handful of them onto the floor, revealing their plump bodies. He picks a few up and pops them into his mouth, the legs still twitching, before they disappear, leaving only remnants stuck between his teeth. Unlike cockroaches found in sewers, Li assures us that the cockroaches found on his farm in Chengdu, Sichuan province, are raised in a closed system, free from bacteria. <laughs> Li Bingkai says a lot of people think cockroaches are disgusting and regard them as pests. The cockroaches he breeds, however, are raised in a clean, controlled environment where they're fed a natural diet free from synthetic substances. He explains that he feeds corn flour, fruit and vegetables to his cockroaches, so their nutritional value is high. He sells these cockroaches as ingredients to several restaurants in the city. The spicy flavour of the sauce, combined with the crunchy texture of the cockroaches, has made Sichuan stir-fried cockroach a popular dish here. Luo Gaofei, a customer at a local restaurant that serves cooked insects, admits that this is his first time eating cockroaches. He says he used to kill them whenever he saw them at home, but having tried them, he now finds them surprisingly delicious. Another diner, Luo Gaoyi, who's also tasting the insect for the first time, describes it as quite tasty, with a fragrant aroma and a satisfying crispy texture. Lee's farm offers both fresh and dehydrated cockroaches, with the dehydrated ones priced at between 100 and 600 yuan, or approximately 14 to 80 US dollars per half kilo. While this may seem relatively expensive, given the low cost of raising these bugs, they are expected to become more affordable in the future, as they're poised to become a primary source of protein for people worldwide. A report from the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization states that between now and 2050, the demand for meat will increase exponentially as the global population rises by another 2 billion. To ensure everyone is fed, the world may need to produce up to 455 million tonnes of meat per annum, up from the current 259 million. With limited resources and space, current production methods may fall short of meeting future demand. As a result, insects are emerging as a promising alternative protein source. Compared to their body mass, these invertebrates are up to 80% edible, while only 55% of a chicken is consumable. Moreover, insects offer protein and fat content comparable to other meats. In terms of production, insects require less space, emit less waste, and have a shorter production cycle. This could well be the answer to future protein needs. With vast biodiversity, we're not limited to eating just cockroaches, though. About a quarter of the world's population has traditionally consumed insects, 
with beetles being the most popular, followed by larvae. In the West, some people are excited to try insects for the first time. After Finland legalised insects as a food in 2017, the market for these alternatives has been steadily growing. Today's menus include crickets and worms. Because I think it's very natural like for humans to eat bugs because like you can pick it with your hand basically I find it like it's I mean in, if, if you look at like the evolution like it, it, it should be a normal thing that we eat bugs but I, I don't know why we don't eat a couple of reasons the environmental awareness of the consumers is growing and insects uh, offer a very good alternative for conventional uh, uh, protein products let's say it this way uh, and also uh, there is uh, also the culinaristic uh, side to it, that you can uh, get something, uh, some new tastes, some new flavors, and something also for the eye, something different. Despite being abundant in nutrients, flavor, and quantity, many people are still, perhaps understandably, hesitant about this new food option, due to its appearance and deep-seated beliefs that insects are dirty. This presents a significant challenge in promoting insects as food, prompting the development of alternative ways of consumption, such as incorporating them into flour. This approach not only addresses concerns about the insect's appearance, but also enhances nutritional value, making dried and ground cockroach flour more appealing to the general public than whole insects. In 2013, scientists in London introduced the world's first lab-grown meat, but only a few lucky people had the opportunity to taste it. It's close to meat, it's not that juicy, but um, uh, the consistency is perfect. The absence is, I, I feel like, the fat, you know, like it's, 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 it's a leanness to it, but, but the bite, you know, feels like, uh, you know, a conventional hamburger. This meat has the flavor of real beef, because it is, in fact, real beef. The difference lies in the production process. No animals need to be slaughtered. The meat we eat is composed of tissues, and tissues are composed of cells. In the production of lab-grown meat, scientists take a tissue sample from an animal, separate the cells, and culture them in a nutrient medium under conditions that closely mimic the animal's body. These cells multiply into millions and develop into tissue identical to the original. The meat grown in the lab initially appears as a white mass. Scientists must add myoglobin to give it meat's characteristic red color and infuse nutrients and fats to make the meat's flavor and texture as close as possible to farm-raised meat. This means that in the future, to produce 100 plates of tenderloin steak, instead of slaughtering 10 cows, we could simply grow 100 pieces of tenderloin from a single animal's tissue sample. Today we have seen proof um, for the first time in the world that you can actually make meat from cells taken out of the cow but not um, produced inside of the cow. And um, you can make a hamburger of it, cook it, and eat it, and have it um, taste reasonably similar to a, uh, to a hamburger from a cow. In the future, the food on our tables may no longer come from farms. This is because agriculture and livestock farming occupy the most significant portion of Earth's land, covering up to 38%. Additionally, Traditional farming demands vast amounts of water. Scientists have found that producing the same amount of protein from beef requires 25 times more feed and 300 times more water compared to, for example, crickets. Moreover, the livestock industry is a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. A 2015 United Nations report states that livestock farms account for 14.5% of all human activities greenhouse gas emissions. 
These gases include methane, produced through the digestive processes of ruminants like cattle. As cows eat grass, they rely on bacteria for digestion, and these bacteria release methane in the cows' stomachs, causing them to belch throughout the day. On average, a single cow emits 150 to 250 litres of methane per day, with some estimates as high as 500 litres. The global cow population, driven by the demand for beef and dairy, has grown to approximately 1.5 billion. On the one hand, plant-based foods are promising. They can offer us a lower greenhouse gas alternative, which is better for the climate. They can potentially be more healthful for some consumers. On the other hand, they're ultimately a very processed food made in a, a factory setting. The scope of lab-grown tissue extends beyond food. Scientists can indeed separate skin cells in a petri dish and stimulate them to produce natural collagen, creating sheets of leather. These lab processes will expand into future industries, when animal-based foods and products could also be able to meet global demand without relying on more livestock land, producing more waste or killing animals. To produce enough food to feed the world's population, forests must be cleared, and residues from fertilizers, chemicals and pesticides contributes to the emission of nitrous oxide, a greenhouse gas. The machinery used in farming also releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. About 10,000 years ago, humans began the agricultural revolution shifting from hunter-gatherer lifestyles to farming. Predictable yields helped create food security and allowed the population to grow. About 300 years ago, the Industrial Revolution led to rapid and efficient production processes, moving from food security to an era of comfort and luxury. In the coming years, though, to feed a global population that could reach 10 billion, we need to produce more food than at any time in the past 10,000 years. The world may indeed need another revolution. If you want to see more great content from all over the world, please like the video, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. Thank you. At first glance, this building in New York City looks like any other, but it is actually a large urban farm using technology to produce food. We think about the characteristics. So for that romaine, you know, how can we make that lettuce sweeter? For the arugula, how do we make that more peppery? Our, our mustard greens have incredible heat and spice. So how are we doing that? We're changing the growing environment to be able to stress the plant and creating these characteristics and how the plant expresses itself. And so that's exciting to think about how we can create and think about menu planning already down at the farm level. Various vegetables are grown vertically to save space and use cloth instead of soil, which can be recycled. Temperature and light are controlled by computer systems, ensuring that despite the erratic weather outside, the crops inside this farm remain lush and green all year round. This vertical farming method reduces water usage by up to 95%, and the crops grown are harvested faster than those grown by traditional methods. Additionally, there's also no need for pesticides, since it is a closed system. Most importantly, Carbon dioxide emissions from transportation are reduced because the farm is located in the heart of the city. The future demand for food production, when water and light are no longer sufficient, also requires technology to create sustainability. Additionally, today, one third of all the food we produce is wasted. This not only means a loss of food, but also the waste of water, 
energy and labor used to produce that food. For some, food is simply a necessity for survival, anything that can stave off hunger. For others, however, food is much more. It's a source of joy, a marker of identity, a heritage, and a point of pride. It is many things more profound and complex than just sustenance. In the future, food will have even greater significance. It will embody the effort to combat hunger for everyone, while being crafted to minimize harm to the planet, all without compromising nutritional value or the desired flavor. <laughs>